So everyone, um, can, can you hear me? Someone thumbs up. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Great. Hello, um, my name is Heather Graham. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I would like to welcome all of you to this rainbow reading. Um, and thank you guys for joining us um, to celebrate the words and voices of the LGBTQ community. Um, this Zoom event was put together by the Salt Lake Community College Student Writing and Reading Center with help from the Creative Writing Group. And it's part of the wonderful programming that was organized by the Gender and Sexuality Student Resource Center to celebrate LGBTQ History Month. Um, I do wanna let you all know right up front that the meeting is recording. Um, we'll post it online afterwards. So I just wanted to make sure we all knew right at the beginning. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask that as we go through, um, everyone in the Zoom keep their mics muted except for the reader so that we have that space to honor the words without background noises and distractions. The chat is open. Um, if you can't see the chat on the side, there's a little chat bubble in the bottom of your Zoom screen you can click on, opens the chat there in the side. And um, I encourage everyone to leave comments, applause, oohs and ahs, and all of the, the good stuff right there um, in the comments so we can cheer on our readers without creating like a huge amount of, of confusion and noise and distraction. Um, also readers, um, feel free to use the chat if you wanna write, like list the the writer and the title of your piece when you're done reading so that any of the people um, that are listening and joining us today can look up your writer and see more of their stuff in the future. Um, I'm starting right on time. It never happens. <laughs> um, so um, again, I want to thank you all for, for joining us. I think this is this is awesome. And I'm so glad to see so many people that are, are in the room. <laughs> And hopefully a few people will pop in. Um, we will make the list of poems um, available afterwards. So if you, um, if the readers, I'll drop them in there. I can compile the list to post after. We'll post the video and that list on the page for the Rainbow Reading, um, as well as on the um, the Facebook page for the Writing Center. Um, so words and stories are really, really important um, to social narratives of life and community and lived experience. Um, they have a way of shaping our understanding and uh, acceptance and our unity. And we wanted to take this time today and have this read in to celebrate some of those words and stories as members of queer communities, as allies and as advocates. So thank you again for coming. And I wanna get it started off um, with welcoming um, Salt Lake Community College President Denise Huftelin to begin with our first reading. Thanks, Heather. It's good to be with you all. And thanks to all of those who you who were involved in creating all of the programming, but especially the Rainbow Read-In. This is a great, cool project and I'm happy to be involved. So I am reading today a poem called The Fourth Sign of the Zodiac by Mary Oliver. And I will put that in the chat here when I'm done. Why should I have been surprised? Hunters walk the forest without a sound, the hunter strapped to his rifle, the fox on his feet of silk, the serpent on his empire of muscles, all move in a stillness, hungry, careful, intent. Just as the cancer entered the forest of my body without a sound. The question is, what will it be like after the last day? Will I float into the sky or will I fray within the earth or a river remembering nothing? How desperate I would be if I couldn't remember the sun rising, if I couldn't remember trees, rivers, if I couldn't even remember beloved, your beloved name. I know you never intended to be in this world, but you're in it all the same. So why not get started immediately? I mean, belonging to it. There is so much to admire, to weep over, and to write music or poems about. Bless the feet that take you to and fro. Bless the eyes and the listening ears. Bless the tongue, the marvel of taste. 
less touching. You could live a hundred years, it's happened or not. I am speaking from the fortunate platform of many years, none of which I think I ever wasted. Do you need a prod? Do you need a little darkness to get you going? Let me be urgent as a knife then and remind you of Keats. So single of purpose and thinking for a while, he had a lifetime. Late yesterday afternoon in the heat, all the fragile blue flowers in bloom in the shrubs in the yard next door had tumbled from the shrubs and lay wrinkled and fading in the grass. But this morning, the shrubs were full of the blue flowers again. There wasn't a single one on the grass. How, I wondered, did they roll back up to the branches that fiercely wanting, as we all do, just a little more of life? Thank you so, so much for starting us off and for joining us today, President Huskman. And so great to have you. Um, and that was such a lovely poem. Thank you. Um, I would next like to welcome to the screen <laughs> Interim Associate Dean of English Linguistics and Writing Studies, Mrs. Lisa Bigmore. I don't know why I said it weird, sorry. <laughs> Lisa. <laughs> well, luckily my mic was muted so you did not hear how I cackled when you said that, so. Um, I, I have two poems that I'm going to read. Um, neither one of them is particularly long. I'm going to start with a poem by Jericho Brown from his book, The New Testament. Um, the poem is called Hustle. They lie like stones and dare not shift. Even asleep, everyone hears in prison. Dwayne Betts deserves more than this dry ink for his teenage years in prison. In the film we keep watching, Nina takes Darius to a stepper's ball. Lovers hustle, slide, and dip as if none of them has a brother in prison. I eat with humans who think any book full of black characters is about race. A book full of white characters examines insanity, but never in prison. His whole family made a barricade of their bodies at the door to room 403. He died without the man he wanted. What use is love at home or in prison? We saw police pull sharks out of the water just to watch them not breathe. A brother meets members of his family as he passes the mirrors in prison. Sundays I washed and dried her clothes after he threw them in the yard. In the novel I love, Brownfield kills his wife gets only seven years in prison. I don't wanna point my own sinful finger. So let's use your clean one instead. Some bright citizen reading this never considered a son's short hair in prison. In our house lived three men with one name and all three fought or ran. I left Nelson Demery III for Jericho Brown, a name I earned in prison. The second poem I want to read is from the poet Meg Day um, from her book, Last Psalm at Sea Level. Some, somewhere there is a long drive waiting for me. A thumb grooved collarbone of land paved like a thick streak of knee scab a jugular in the night, its pulse the uneven stalk of pacing. It loiters, impatient and yawning, stretched, upon, stretched open at the mouth as if to signal it is time, as if to suggest I have outstayed my welcome. Before you were born, my pops taught me to read the lines of driftwood. This one will warp, this one will rot. My fists full of sand dollars, his focus a deep seated furrow in the folds of my forehead. We sat salt licked for hours in the sun, pulling slick kelp blades from their twine, learning how to tie a knot, training to build by binding, to tether two at once. Somewhere there is another sky, 
shark skinned and smoothed by sandpaper, reeled right into the dock of a sweet boarded porch floor lapping a smooth railed wraparound whose hips have settled, save the swing at the front, seats two, and the sway that gives when monsoon season comes. Find me there, still thick side with the asphalt of April, knee bows hugged the, uh, hugging the edge, my legs of driftwood tucked like bouquets under each arm and in the middle, the elbow of a rocking chair, the one I promised you, cradled easy in the lope of my nodding, a half hitch of fastening, a button through its tear. That was so fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, next, I would like to invite Katie Lewis to read. I'm coming. Let me share my video. All right. Hello. Um, so I started, I'm not a poet. Let's just get that um, up front. Um, but I started writing a poem. I came out as bisexual publicly about five years ago. And um, I've sort of learned to love to embrace it and claim what I am. So um, I debated um, reading part of a poem that I had started. It's not finished, so that's also important to note. But I decided that I'm going to read it as well as a poem by a queer South African poet. Um, and in part, I'm not doing reading the poem that I started um, because I think it's anything great. I just want to claim who I am and invite anyone here who's been um, wondering about who they are or feeling lighter because you've claimed who you are or in a space where you want to claim who you are and aren't quite sure how to do that. It's my invitation to you um, and also a recognition of you that I see you and I stand with you. So the poem is called Of Letters. Obituary, future, sometime. Things they might say, probably will. She was a mother, a wife, a teacher. All things women are valorized for their service to others. Their meaning and matter struck flesh with flesh someone skimmed me with. Often only in who I was, who they were in relationships to those they cared for. Taught, gave up parts and holes of themselves for, vanished in them for. And these would all be true, all the roles and relationships. This fragment of text about me won't really be fully about me. It will be about what people thought they knew of me, the parts of me, the parts they won't, that won't put my family off. It might say I was a woman of letters and mind. I am, will be, was. This fragment maybe it will be more like a eulogy, a tenderly wrought summation of my parts. Won't tell you about Chris, Mel, or Elle, women whom I've cared for and been cared by, Lovers from the past who matter still in this present and will matter as I burn, as my ashes are spread in my five sacred spaces, where my children, my partners, my other blood, both biological and found, scatter me and scatter with me. So that's as far as I'm on that poem. Um, and then um, this is a really excellent collection of poems um, by Koleka Putuma called Collective Amnesia. She's a queer South African poet who is absolutely amazing. Um, and the two poems I wanna read from her are Incarnation and Inland. Reincarnation, the mirror spits your grandmother back at you. Her determined eyes, her machete mouth, her howling courage. You are third generation Messiah. Inland. It takes strength to grieve, to fall apart, leaking things, people who will never return to you. And yet we are taught that mourning is the opposite of strength. How many of us have seen our mothers weep, the kind of weeping that has you drenched at the seams, drowning in salt water, arms flailing for help, the kind you bargain with to let you go alive. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Katie. That was incredible. Thank you. Um, next up, um, I would like to invite Clint Gardner to read. Thanks, Heather. And thanks for putting this all together. You've done amazing work. Um, 
very proud of, of your ability to organize all this. It's been um, great to see all the people who've come out and all the readers. Um, I'm Clint Gardner. I'm the program manager of College Writing and Reading Centers here at Salt Lake Community College. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, and I'm coming to you live. That sounds very TV-like, but I'm coming to you live from the Student Writing and Reading Center here at Redwood Campus, so that's why I'm wearing the mask. Um, but um, I just want to say that we here in the Student Writing and Reading Center are here for you. Um, this fall semester, we do have in-person tutoring, but we also have a lot of online offerings for you. Um, today, I want to read a poem by um, W.H. Auden. Um, Auden was a um, British American poet. He lived in the U.S. as well as Britain, off and on, taught here. Um, but one of the reasons I chose this poem was I was doing a little reading and, and research for this. Um, and I came across um, Auden's obituary, sadly. He died in 1973. Um, and it's being 1973, um, it's sad to read an obituary that the only relationship mentioned besides having good friends is his wife who he married to get out of Nazi Germany, um, simply because as the daughter of, of Thomas Mann and an activist herself, she was put in danger by the Nazis, but she was also endangered because of her sexuality. She would have been sent to a death camp if her sexuality had been made known. And the reason I chose that I wanted to bring that up is, you know, someone like Auden, um, was not afforded the ability that is only, what, three years old in this country at this point, to be able to marry someone whom he loved. And we need to be careful and aware of the danger of that eroding liberties, as, as some might say, and the political situation that may take that away from people. But this poem from Auden is from 1947, and it's just simply called Poem. He watched with all his organs of concern how princes walk, what wives and children say, reopened old graves in his heart to learn what laws the dead had died to disobey, and came reluctantly to his conclusion all the armchair philosophers are false. To love another adds to the confusion. The song of pity is the devil's waltz. And bowed to fate and was successful so that soon he was the king of all the creatures. Yet shaking in an autumn nightmare saw, approaching down an empty corridor a figure with his own distorted features that wept and grew enormous and cried, woe. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading today uh, and for all that you had to say there. <laughs> um, next, I would like to welcome Elisa Stone to read. I'm just trying to take my, get my video on. There we go. So hello everyone. Uh, my name's Elisa. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm a queer studies professor here at the college. I co-chair our LGBTQ plus steering committee. I'm an advisor to the Queer Student Association. And I'm currently helping the Utah Pride Center plan the upcoming Gender Evolution Conference, November 13th and 14th. Everything is online and I would love it if you could join us. It's Utah's only gender conference. So I'm reading a piece today that is actually uh, written by my brother. His name's John Bonner. And he published it originally in the Huffington Post. I'll put the link in the chat. And it was published on November 19th of 2016. But I think it has cycled back around to being especially relevant today. It's called, Will You Join Me? 
I was five years old when I first learned what the word faggot meant. I had just started kindergarten and was playing a solo game of hopscotch on the school grounds during recess. A game I'd learned to play with my sisters on the driveway in front of our home. When I found myself surrounded by a group of towering sixth grade boys, I was beginning to ask if they wanted to play hopscotch with me when the first boy pushed me hard from behind. I stumbled to the asphalt, my small bare knees seared with pain and were soon covered in blood from the indentations the rocks made in my skin. I didn't cry. I placed my hands on the chalked square in front of me and knew not to speak. Get up, faggot, one of the boys shouted. I did as he said, only to have another boy push me back across the circle. They continued shoving me between them until I fell backward and hit my head on the pavement. I still didn't cry. They could see the blood starting to drip from my hair. Let's get out of here, he's not worth it, one of them said. They ran off toward the monkey bars. I stared up at the sky and reached up to feel my wet hair. Only then did I let tears fall down the sides of my face and pool with my blood on the hot asphalt. A playground attendant found me several minutes later and asked what had happened. I didn't tell her, how could I? I didn't understand it myself. I did know that the word they used was not to be repeated. My mom came to get me from school. I didn't know what to say to her either. As she was carefully cleaning the rocks and blood from my hair, I asked, Mom, what does faggot mean? She squeezed my hand, linked back her own tears, and told me not to pay any mind to what I'd heard that day on the playground. I asked my dad the same question later that night. He looked startled and alarmed. Where did you learn that word, he asked. I told him. In a stern voice, he declared that it was something strange men with a single pierced ear did to each other, something unutterably wrong, that I was not that, and I should never say the word again. I was called that word many times over the course of the next 12 years. It didn't stop until I graduated from high school, left my hometown, and learned there was a much bigger world that could see me beyond the limitations of fear. Last week, a stranger crossing the street stepped directly into my path and shouted, faggot. I wish I could tell you that I stood my ground and gave him a piece of my mind. I didn't. I averted my eyes and kept moving forward. I wish I could tell you my first thought was, what's his problem? That's not what I thought. My first thought was that I should stop wearing purple earbuds and cream-flecked cable-knit sweaters. I've been thinking all week about what it will mean to live in Trump's America. I've seen the same word that was shouted at me at five, and again now at 38, spray painted on churches and across car doors in different corners of this country. Other words and symbols of hate have been used this week in unprecedented numbers to target marginalized groups, Muslims, Jews, Blacks, Latinos, refugees, women. Do I believe all Trump supporters are racist, homophobic, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, and misogynistic? No, I don't. But I also don't believe you get to choose the consequences of your words when hate speech is wielded as a weapon against minority groups on the campaign trail. Many may claim they were, quote, willing to overlook the divisive incendiary rhetoric during this election in favor of rejecting establishment candidates, choosing to voice their very real economic woes by upending the proverbial apple cart. They may not have fully realized then that one of the consequences of this election would be to embolden the nation's bullies, young and old, bringing, the, bringing them out from the shadows into legitimizing light. I hope some see that now. I hope some regret casting a vote that entrenched the roots of despotism in our democracy. And if they do, I hope they will join me, 
join me in standing up for the woman who was derided for wearing her hijab on the subway. Join me in declaring that people of color should not be disproportionately incarcerated and killed by law enforcement, but protected and served according to the credo bravely upheld by the best of our men and women in uniform. Join me in affirming the vitality of our LGBTQ communities. Join me with raised voices in proclaiming that the exploitation of women's bodies is not who we are. Join me in decrying hate speech, slurs and epithets whenever and wherever they are uttered. Join me in reminding the world that the promise engraved at the foot of the Statue of Liberty, bring me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, are still the words we choose to live and if necessary, die by. I think all the time about that five-year-old boy lying alone on the pavement, looking up at a stark blue sky. I imagine someone reaching out their hand to him, lifting him up, holding him close. I imagine it being your hand and mine. Will you join me? Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisa. That was so powerful and it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I would like to invite Bernice Olivias to read next. Sorry if I said your last name wrong. Olivas. Olivas, thanks. Um, I'm reading three pieces by a poet by the name of Arden Hill. He's a close friend of mine and the father of my goddaughter. He is a Louisiana poet who finished his um, PhD in poetry at Uni uh, University of Nebraska and is currently working on a collection about motherhood and adoption. The first piece is called, I don't see you as queer, erasure as compliment. You say you don't see me as queer, you can't see me. I'm the ghost of girl, gone in the glistening silver. We wore white and rabbit fur, kid leather gloves and tennis shoes, lost in the folds of our beaded gowns. No mass wedding, we processed on a float drawn by a tractor down litter lined streets with boxes of Mardi Gras de blooms and plastic beads by our sides. We threw favors to the crowd. I was the debutante mouthing, show me your tits. And I was the one pitching hard. The second piece is called Walking Down Third Street. Look, she says, a girl without her shirt on. And now my biggest fear is walking shirtless past the house where a second grader rides her scooter back and forth across a weed speckled driveway as a man who is clearly a man spits tobacco in a cup and calls out to his daughter what did you say to her i mean what did you say to him i walk by with my bluffing body but look dad she insists and he does not closely enough to see the scar lines around my areola or the spot on my neck he could wrap his palm around the spot where an adam's apple might be although he is sitting he doesn't look down to the empty front of my pants as I pass, I imagine his eyes hitting my body, which pandemic has put in reverse, the zaftive curve of hips, a soft swell beneath each nipple, the round of my belly crossed by the long imprint of a surgical star. I tell myself it's the scar catching people's eyes. It's the scar, I say, to double takes in the men's room. Scar, I whisper to my masked face in the mirror. And the last piece is before birth. In this photograph, you are fetal. My phone without a cord, my cordless womb. Your picture arrives from my sister who holds your blood mother's hand as the ultrasound catches you in profile. In this photograph, you are rendered white and gray and black. Cranial cysts stand out so sharp, no doctor needs to circle them. I count spaces in place of chromosomes. Google trisomony. There are so many ways to be born with just minutes to live. In this photograph, your face accompanies heartbeat. I lift my shirt and place the phone against the flat contours of my chest. Let the speaker push the sound of you into me. Thank you so much for that. that those were so good. Um, I would like to next invite Peter Mosman to the screen. 
Hey, everybody. Um, I wanted to give a little context to mine. I know um, W.H. Auden has already, um, I got here late. So um, did anybody read W.H. Auden's um, September 1st, um, 1939 poem? Am I good to read that? Um, I wanted to give a little context of it and why I'm, I'm reading it. Um, the, so in 2015, that was the year that I came out and I came out because I watched a film called The Normal Heart, which is, um, uh, it's from activist Larry Kramer. He wrote a book, which became a Broadway play, which became this film. And he gets the title, The Normal Heart from this poem. Um, and so watching that film kind of kicked me out of the closet. And so I felt like, um, I mean, I owe, it a, I owe a lot to Larry Kramer and I think Larry Kramer owes a lot to W.H. Auden and this poem. And, um, and so I feel like it would only be fair to read the poem. Um, so I'm gonna read that. And then I wanted to read, I mean, I'm not a writer at all, but I wanted to share one of my Facebook posts that I, I had written a few years ago um, when I was single and looking for love after feeling like I didn't deserve love. And so, um, I'm going to read those two pieces and we'll go from there. So September 1st, 1939 by W.H. Auden. I sit in one of the dives on 52nd Street, uncertain and afraid as the clever hopes expire of a low dishonest decade. Waves of anger and fear circulate over the bright and darkened lands of the earth, obsessing our private lives. The unmentionable odor of death offends the September night. Accurate scholarship can unearth the whole, of, the whole offense from Luther until now that has driven a culture mad. Find what occurred at Linz, what huge Im imago made a psychopathic god. I and the public know what all school children learn. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. Exiled, oh, a word I don't know, exiled Thucydides knew all that a speech can say about democracy and what dictators do, the elderly rubbish they talk to an apathetic grave. Analyzed all in his book, the enlightenment driven away, the habit forming pain, mismanagement and grief, we must suffer them all again. Into this neutral air where blind skyscrapers use their full height to proclaim the strength of collective man, each language pours its vain competitive excuse. But who can live for long in a euphoric dream? Out of the mirror they stare imperialism's face at the international wrong. International wrong. Faces along the bar cling to their average day the lights must never go out. The music must always play. All the conventions conspire to make this fort assume the furniture of home, lest we should see where we are, lost in a haunted wood, children afraid of the night who have never been happy or good. The windiest militant trash, important person shout is not so crude as our wish. What Mad Nijinsky wrote about Diaglev is true of the normal heart for the error bred in the bone of each man and oh, sorry my goodness the okay sorry let me it's true of the normal heart for the error bred in the bone of each woman and each man craves what it cannot have not universal love but to be loved alone from the conservative dark into the ethical life the dense commuters come, repeating their morning vow. I will be true to the wife. I'll concentrate more on my work. The, and helpless governors wake to resume their compulsory gain. Who can release them now? Who can reach the deaf? Who can speak for the dumb? All I have is a voice to undo the folded lie, the romantic lie in the brain of the sensual man in the street and the lie of authority whose buildings grope the sky. There's no such thing as the state and no one exists alone. Hunger allows no choice to the citizen or the police. We must love one another or die. Defenseless under the night, our world in stupor, in stupor lies, 
yet dotted everywhere, ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them, of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. Whew, sorry, I was get a little emotional there. Um, so this, this next thing that I wanted to share, like I said, is a, a post um, that I shared two years ago. Um, and it, uh, I, I'd seen this commercial. It was a commercial from an airline company in New Zealand, I believe. But it was all about um, the, um, the commercial was about um, love. And when you feel like you need to let go to like it, it shows a bunch of hands holding and they let go whenever they see someone look at them or in situations that they might feel judged. And, and the whole thing is about when you feel like letting go hold tight. Um, and so this is, this is what I wrote after seeing that, um, that commercial. When I look back at all the prayers I've offered up to the heavens throughout my life, a majority of them had a theme. From a preteen to a seasoned vicinarian, from the nightly bedside routine to the regular, sometimes multiple times an hour plea racing through my mind as I tried to navigate my days, too many of my prayers focused on the request to be healed, cured, fixed, or saved from my same-sex attractions. These attractions, I was taught, can lead to some of the worst sins next to murder. These attractions, I was taught, can be cured or overcome with enough faith faithfulness and commandment keeping. These attractions I was taught are leading the attack on the family and all things sacred. These attractions I was taught later on can be managed in a fulfilling life of celibacy and aloneness. Celibacy and aloneness became my enzyme of salvation. My prayers solicited the strength to focus on the promised blessings of, the, of that enzyme all the while, I was bombarded with the glory of heterosexual romantic love and companionship from all angles. Music, movies, church, social media, friends getting married and having kids, couples holding hands, walking down the street, being asked if I'm dating any cute girls these days, and literally everything else reminded me that relationships are the most important thing in life, unless you're queer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, sorry. Dear Heavenly Father, please fix me so that I can be normal. Please bless me with the ability to fall in love with a girl. Please bless me to have the strength to get through this or please let me die so I don't need to struggle anymore. My prayers didn't work. All of those tens of thousands of prayers offered never worked. I was never cured or fixed or saved for my same sex attractions. I was never able to fall in love with a girl. I was never caught in a freak accident that ended my life. When at the end of my rope, I decided I should try changing my prayers before I try killing myself. In prayer, I asked what I was supposed to do with my same sex attractions, where I fit in the plan of salvation with my attractions and where do I go from here? It turns out I had been praying for the wrong things all along started getting answers to these new questions, answers that helped me see that I wasn't ever broken, flawed, or unworthy. I learned of my divine purpose as a gay man and of my place in the plan of salvation. Of course, that place didn't require celibacy and aloneness, but it included a space for romantic love, for a romantic love same-sex relationship. Believe it or not, relationships can be the most important thing in life especially if you're queer. The divine was affirming of not only my same-sex attractions, but of my potential relationship with another man. What? <laughs> One can imagine this newfound excitement I had for life as I embarked on this new path of being my authentic, God-affirmed self in search of my authentic, God-affirmed same-sex relationship. With the nervousness of a teenage boy, I got to experience my first date with someone I was actually attracted to a couple years short of my 30th birthday. I have finally been able to have that breath stopping excitement when arms touch in a theater. 
to follow through with the sparks that fly when eyes needed a party, to feel the soul crushing pain of rejection after you've given your most vulnerable self and to have the hopeful butterflies resurrect with every new prospect. Every day I'm single, I reflect on the boy I used to be, the one who tried to date girls and pray to be changed or to die, to reflect on the love I've received and given since I changed those prayers. It's hard to be patient when something like something that I've been denied my whole life is seemingly within arm's reach. But every day I'm single, I remind myself that I am worthy of that love and that it's divinely affirmed when it does happen and it will happen. It has happened. <laughs> Here's to the ones who have lost hope that their prayers would be answered. Here's to the ones who are holding on to that flicker of hope. When you feel like letting go, hold tight. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was um, just from the chat. You can see how incredibly moved everyone is. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> um, next, I would like to invite um, Monson Hayes to the screen. Hey, actually, I, I thought of a poem that I wrote that would really fit in that I want to look for. So can I jump uh, to the have one person jump ahead of me. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna go off screen because I want to dig okay. around real quick. All right. So then um, Anna Petty, would you like to read? Yes, sorry about that. Wait, it was just loading. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep, good to go. Okay, cool. Um, hello, my name is Anna Petty. My pronouns are she, her, and they, them. I'm a student here at Salt Lake Community College and I'm sharing my own work today. Uh, not a poem, but a flash narrative that I wrote for assignment in my online English class. A lot of LGBT stories end up in tragedy. If the main character is openly gay, trans, or queer in any way, there's a good chance they'll end up dying in the end. I wanted to write about two women in love who um, end up surviving. So this is what I came up with and it's called Survivor's Guilt. Uh, thank you for listening. Soft music filtered in and out of Sage's ears, easing her into consciousness. The truck bounced up and down as it went along a windy canyon road, making it hard to rest. Sage didn't want to open her eyes. She knew that once she was fully awake, she wouldn't like it. Sage furrowed her eyebrows with her eyes still tightly shut. Her insides reeled within while her head pounded. Sage covered her head with her hands and held still for nearly a minute. Finally gathering the courage to open her eyes, Sage shifted in her seat. Her head was resting on the window and she was hugging her legs to her chest. It was dark outside. There was no moon in the sky, just stars, lots and lots of stars. The music valve was playing caught her attention. The lyrics registered slowly into her mind, but after a while she was aware of everything around her. The scent of the old musty truck, the soreness in her back and neck, Val tapping her fingers on the wheel and the intense guilt looming over her. Rubbing her eyes, Sage sat up fully and groaned. Hey, Val said, barely rubbed for breath. She was holding the steering wheel with one hand and glanced over at Sage. Shit, you look like hell. Well, I feel like hell, Sage mumbled, grumbled. I get it. Sage looked out the windshield inside. The headlights illuminated the surrounding area. Tall pine trees were on either side of the road, making it difficult to see much of anything else. Sage looked over at Val and studied her face. She seemed contemplative. The dark circles under her eyes gave away how much sleep she had missed in the past 24 hours. Her lips were chapped and her face was drained of most of its color. Valerie, Sage started, knowing that what she was about to say will make her friend upset. Val firmly pressed her lips together, staring resolutely on the road. Sage pressed on. Valerie, please, we need to stop and rest. We can't, not right now. Her tone was cold in a matter of fact way Usually there was no getting past Val when she made up her mind, but the circumstances called for it. Maybe a compromise will do. Okay, Sage, not, uh, Sage nodded. How about you take a break and I drive? No, her hands tightened on the wheel. Sage huffed, folded her arms and looked out the window. This girl, they had gone through so much together. Couldn't Val trust her? A few moments passed, her head still ached. A deer weaved through the woods alongside the truck before disappearing from view. She heard a small sniff and another. Sage startled, turning to see 
His tears slipped down with Val's face. Val quickly wiped them away, trying to save her crumbled composure. I guess, Val gasped, struggling to control her breaths. I thought that when we finally escaped, I would feel free. Screams echoed in Sage's mind. Her hands started to shake. We just need more time to process this. Maybe get some sleep. Val shook her head. I won't be able to sleep without seeing their bodies. Nothing can fix what we've done. Stop. Sage gripped her stomach, feeling ill. It wasn't our fault. How can you say that? We could have stopped it. We could have saved them, but we didn't. You didn't. Sage couldn't breathe. She couldn't think. She was going to throw up. Why, Sage? Why did you save me instead of them? Pull over, Valerie. Now. Sage, now. The brake screeched to a halt. Sage fumbled with her seatbelt before flinging the door open and retching on the side of the road. She wiped her mouth, the taste of acidic bile left on her tongue. Her whole body shook. I'm sorry. Sage sat back up, staring at her clenched hands. Val let out a small laugh. I didn't think you threw up on purpose. Right. They sat there with the door open for what felt like ages. Val turned off the music. The chirps of crickets and frogs filled her ears. You're right, Sage said, facing Val. Val's eyes were red-rimmed. She looked exhausted, defeated. We made, I made a huge, irreversible decision. Sage reached out, grabbing Val's hands, but it wasn't a mistake. Sage brought her closer, pulling her into a hug. I couldn't stand losing you. You were the most important person to me. Sage honestly didn't know how Val would react to that. She could push her away, yell at her some more, blame everything on her and leave. Alternatively, she could say that it was okay. Everything that happened was justified. They could move on without another thought. Sage didn't know which outcome would, would, be, would be worse. Instead, Val was frozen. She didn't move or even take a breath. Sage separated them, holding her at arm's length. Valerie? Her face was downcast, but a blush bloomed on her cheeks. It seemed like she was trying to figure out what to say, to settle on the right words. Sage sighed. Don't worry. I know everything is messed up right now. But, Val mustered, a fragile hope stringing her along. But, we have each other. We survived. Things could only get better from here, right? Val was quiet. The idling engine rumbled as she finally looked back up at Sage. Okay, Val said, slightly nodding as if, there was, as if she was trying to convince herself that things will get better. She reached for Sage's hand and squeezed it once before climbing out the truck. Hey, where are you going? Sage called out, panic rising in her throat. Val made her way around to Sage's door, taking a nap as requested. Scooch. Sage's tense shoulders dropped. She allowed herself to smile as she slid into the driver's seat. They buckled in and turned the music back on. The lyrics melded into the background as Sage put the truck into drive. She gripped the wheel and asked, where to? So, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you so much for reading that. That was so cool. And um, Monson, are you ready to, to read? Okay, so next up we have Monson Hayes. All right, so if you see in the background, I have some Keith Haring art, uh, just to kind of celebrate Keith Haring. He's, uh, I think he was like really great. And uh, his art came out in the eighties when there was a lot of activism about AIDS. And I think, um, through his art, he expressed a lot of important ideas and um, brought a, a connectedness uh, that artwork has the magic of uh, being able to create in uh, ways that, you know, words often can't. But that being said, I'm gonna share some words uh, from a transgender performance artist. Uh, it goes by the name of Alokvate Menon. And uh, this piece is entitled, the loneliness of being yourself. And uh, this often, this, you know, specifically speaks to uh, their journey, but I think as individuals, we can all think about any times we felt other, uh, felt a bit displaced. And uh, so, um, you know, I found a lot of personal resonance uh, in their expressions. So uh, the loneliness of being yourself. They will tell you to be yourself, and then they will punish you when you are. They will encourage you to pursue your dreams, and then when you do, they will call you selfish. 
They will create marketing campaigns and slogans and video reels that tell you to live your truth. But there will be no flowers when you do. There will be loneliness. There will be fear. There may even be violence. My entire life, I was told to express myself. And then when I did, people couldn't handle it. And I was told that coming out would make me happy. And then I got bashed and no one seemed to care. And what I'm getting at is that they're lying to us. And what's even more painful about that is that they don't even know that they are. When you repeat something over and over again, you begin to think it's real. What I've learned is they only want half truths. They only want you to live your best life and still grovel to be them. Be yourself, but not too much. Shine bright, but tone it down. They cannot handle real truth because real truth is a mirror and they cannot look at themselves. They prefer to look at you. There will be no camera crews or congratulations when you do that thing of excavating yourself from the graves we mistake as bodies, holding it out to the light, there will be no celebrations because chances are there will be no one else there. There is a direct correlation between giving birth to yourself and your relationships dying. The more you gain, the more you lose. When you unearth her, she will not be conveniently beautiful and she will not say the right things, but she will be dignified nonetheless. And it is that dignity that ability to hold your head high and say, I am, and mean it, for once in your goddamn life, means something beyond what they told you to be, believe, in a world that tries its best to dispossess us of everything, there is something resistant about walking away with your dignity. Thank you so much. That was really good. Let's see powerful words. And then uh, I have a poem that I wrote um, entitled, This Is Me, or We Wear Masks. <clears throat> and this is that poem I was telling you about, Peter. I found it. <clears throat> I need to speak. I need to illustrate. I need to enunciate with my breath, with my words, ideas from inner chambers which might surprise those who expect a different portrait. My image is multifaceted and I wear many masks. Every day, a carnival. With a bag of masks, I wander alleys and streets, into buildings, up staircases, conversing with certain people, wearing certain masks from my bag, which they will recognize, all to put them at ease as they hear my words, see my image, and draw their conclusions. I move on with my bag of masks into different streets and different buildings, drawing into new conversations, wearing other masks, and then I wander home with my bag, wanting to set it down, but I can't. And even within the confines of my own home, my refuge, my sanctuary, I am wearing masks until I find myself alone in front of the mirror and I peel away the last of my masks and my glorious self is revealed and I wish I could toss my bag of masks into the pit of Tarsus never to return and simply be my enlightened self. Sadly, I realize this would be far too much for others to bear beyond their ability to comprehend my true and complex self. I bask in the glow of me, trying to absorb myself as I re-energize for another day, shouldering my bag and slipping on masks. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, next, I would like to invite Ali Arbuckle to read. Hi everyone. So um, I'm a student at Solid Community College, um, currently in the pre-med program. I actually took the 
uh, queer studies class from Elisa several semesters ago. Um, and I started on this as one of my projects in there. Um, I'm a children's book author. And up to this point, all of my books have been about first responders, um, but just making sure that it's, I feel like it's kind of my job as a children's book author to teach children, um, not only children, but their parents also about what is real in this world. So when it comes to first responders, you know, it's like a lot of little kids don't realize that they're just like us, you know, they go to the grocery store, they have a family at home, they sleep at night, you know, things like that. Um, so this book is actually not even my next one coming out. This is two away. So it hasn't been illustrated yet. Um, and this is quite a rough draft. Um, so if you have any <laughs> tips or things that you might change or add or anything, um, I'll put my email in the chat after this and you can feel free to have an open conversation with me. Um, it's called, What is Value? So value can apply to different areas in our lives. Mathematics, music, linguistics, art, money. When it comes down to the word's definition, it basically is a way we order everyday items. One dollar is more valuable than one penny. In music, an eighth note takes less time than a whole note. Therefore, a whole note's value is more. But does value apply to people? Absolutely. Let's take a walk in the park and I'll show you. Look, here's a nice bench in the shade. See those children playing on the playground? Let's take a closer look at them. These kids come to play here every day. Anna is that little girl with blonde hair at the top of the slide. She likes to wear bows in her hair and always has a new dress on. Mimi is at the bottom of the slide ready to catch her. Mimi is wearing clothes from her older brother that were passed down as she grew up. Her pants have patches and her shoes are far from new. These girls look so different from each other, yet they love to meet at the park every day and play. Anna knows that Mimi's wearing handed down clothes. That doesn't decrease Mimi's value to Anna. Anna and Mimi are best friends. See the taller child near the ladder? That's Addison. Addison uses they, them pronouns. That means Addison isn't necessarily a boy or a girl. Addison is the oldest of all these children, nearing 13. Last summer, Addison was a shy child sitting on this very bench. One day, Susanna came over and asked Addison if they wanted to play pirates. I nudged Addison and hinted to go play. On the way to the playground, Susanna asked Addison's name. They shyly said, um, I'm Addison. She made sure Addison never got left out. Susanna became more valuable to Addison because they felt loved and included. Addison didn't become less valuable to Suzanne because she learned about using they them pronouns. They didn't become less valuable when we learned that Addison started using that name when Susanna simply asked, what's your name? Mark and Gio are playing catch with a baseball in the field. Mark has light peachy colored skin and Gio has dark skin like chocolate. Both regularly get called over by Gio's dad and get slathered in sunscreen and go back out to play. Gio and Mark recognize that their skin is different from each other, but this doesn't decrease the value of their friend. Even though Gio has dark skin and Mark has light skin, they both get sunburned on sunny days. They also love baseball. Oh darn, it's time for Alma to go home. Her mother has the stroller all packed and ready to go. But it looks like they left something on the ground. Oh no, it's Alma's baby sister's favorite blanket. That person running on the trail noticed it and picked it up. Thank goodness they noticed and were able to return it to Ms. Roma. Did you notice that runner? Did it matter if they were a boy or a girl or neither? Did it change what they did if they had different skin than Alma or her mother? They could have been wearing um, store-bought clothes. They could have been wearing, wearing homemade clothes. Miss Roma was still very grateful to have a blanket returned and she said, thank you. So what have we learned today at the park? Anna and Mimi are best friends. Susanna helped Addison feel welcome. Mark and Gio might have a future in baseball. Alma loves her mom and a baby sister. The people around us are human beings, just like you and me. Just because they look different 
believe something different, or live somewhere else does not make them more or less valuable to us. Value is based on their actions and how they treat us. Remember, you are also of value to other people. Your value is based on kind words and nice actions. Um, stand up for what you believe in. Stand up for others who are being bullied. Make a difference in this world. Thank you so, so much for sharing that and for writing children's books that address these things. I think that's amazing. Um, um, I wanted to check, um, is Sarah Thomas here? And just like, I can't see you in the chat. This is the next person that had signed up, but I didn't see the name. So Sarah, no? Okay, I'm gonna guess they dismissed us today. Um, Clint wanted to say a few words before we have our last, uh, our last leader for today. So I'm gonna pop it over to Clint for a few minutes and then I'll be back. Thank you again, Heather. Um, I just wanted to thank all the readers. Um, excellent um, sharing, um, um, especially all the, the readers who read their own work. Um, amazing. Um, if, you're, if it's not published yet, I would suggest you seek a publication for it. We have a couple here at Salt Lake Community College. We have Folio, which is primarily for students, uh, but we also have the um, anthology, um, which would also be an excellent venue, which is open to the entire Salt Lake Community College community. Um, um, we also have, if you're interested, a um, chapbook contest. Um, this year's chapbook contest is nonfiction, which may fit right in with what you're interested in writing about. So I believe that's also only open to SLCC students. Um, but if you um, haven't had a chance to be on campus and you want to come by and see our display, um, we do have a display of LGBTQ uh, plus poets um, and quotations, poets and writers actually. Um, um, Heather mentioned uh, children's books. Um, um, Maurice Sendak is up on the wall there. Um, um, many folks don't know that Sendak uh, was gay um, and are often surprised by that. Anyway, the, um, I want to thank everybody again for reading and I also want to thank Heather for organizing um, this wonderful event. Um, you did an excellent job, Heather, and emceeing us um, through it. Um, and I'm just going to turn it back over to Heather so she, we can have our final reader. Thank you, Heather. Thanks so much, Clint. Um, it's been a pleasure to organize this. Um, our last reader is going to be Lynn Kilpatrick, um, if you are ready. I am ready. Um, thanks, yeah, to Heather and to Peter and to anyone else who organized this. It's been great. Um, to listen to everyone. It's been very inspiring. So I'm going to read a poem from Jericho Brown who was the, I didn't know this until I was looking him up today that he was actually the first black gay poet to win the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and this is a book I happen to be just reading right now. Um, so I wanted to share one of his poems. So this one is called, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is weird. It's called Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medications turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me. In the dream where I am an island, in the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. And for um, again, for everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for this little celebration of words and stories. I am so very grateful for everyone who signed up to read your own words or someone else's to help um, celebrate that and to, uh, um, to like make sure these voices are being heard. It means a lot to me as a member of the queer community and as um, someone that cares about words and cares about them being heard. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for every single person that was in this, uh, this event today. Um, I posted in the chat the link to the list of the remaining LGBTQ History Month events that the GSSRC put together. There's still a couple that are 
um, left for the rest of the month and some that were ongoing. So definitely check that out. Um, and I also put the link for that page um, and for the Facebook or it will put the recording of this event and the book, the list of um, poems that uh, the readers read today on both of those places. So you can reference them again. Um, and again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming out and joining us today. Um, that, that's the end of our program and um, thank you. Uh, have a great day, everyone.